Welcome to HSC Economics Made Easy. This is part five of a series on the balance of payments. You can find the previous installments in the description below. Previously, we learned about the cyclical and structural influences on the BOGS and MPY accounts in the current account. We observed that the current account has a long-term trend of being in the deficit. Today, I want to discuss the consequences of this current account deficit. First, I'm going to look at the arguments against the CAD, as in why it's bad for the economy. Most of these arguments revolve around the NPY account. A high NPY deficit reflects foreign liabilities, which is our first issue. The level of liabilities may grow over time because any unpaid servicing costs will add to the level of liabilities, which in turn leads to even higher servicing costs. If this cycle continues, it could lead to an economy borrowing just to repay its debt servicing costs, and this is called the debt trap scenario. The flaw and consequence of this is the loss of international investor confidence. Put yourself in the shoes of a lender or investor. If you have invested into a country that is recording high levels of debt, that's not going to instill a whole lot of confidence, right? So what do you do? Two common responses are, number one, withdraw your investments. If this response is widespread among foreign investors, it leads to capital flight. This was the case in 1997's Asian financial crisis. Capital flight is not only a leakage to the economy, causing falling economic activity. It could also cause severe depreciations of the currency. Which brings me to another consequence of a high CAD, increased volatility for exchange rates. So aside from withdrawing my investments, I've also got another option as an investor or lender. That is to demand higher interest rates as a risk premium. Loss of investor confidence can cause debt servicing costs to increase, further worsening foreign liability levels and the NPY deficit. The next consequence of a CAD is that it's a constraint on future economic growth. What a BOGS deficit and NPY deficit have in common is that they both represent outflows of non-reversible earnings going overseas. They're leakages to the economy and therefore will cause aggregate demand to fall and the economy to contract as they increase. This is called the balance of payments constraint. And this is what led Prime Minister Paul Keating to give the warning that Australia would become a banana republic if we didn't get our CAD under control. Which brings me to one more consequence of a high CAD more contractionary economic policy. In my previous videos about influences on the CAD, I showed that both BOGS and MPY tend to worsen with strong domestic economic growth. So to improve the CAD, the government could use contractionary macroeconomic policy. By slowing down the economy, disposable income would fall, leading to less spending on imports and an improved BOGS. Company profits would also fall, causing less dividend outflows, improving MPY, and these lead to an improved CAD. Furthermore, there's something called the twin deficits hypothesis, which is an extension concept that theorizes that budget deficits lead to greater current account deficits. So in order to reduce the CAD, a contractionary stance must be taken to bring the deficit to a surplus. This is what the Keating government did in the late 1980s, but that really is the only time fiscal policy has been aimed at reducing the CAD. So those are the arguments that say a CAD is bad. I'm now going to go through the counter arguments. That is, a CAD isn't so bad. First of all, box in a deficit means that we're buying imports. What's so bad about that? Imports are good. They increase our consumer choice, giving us access to cheaper and greater variety of goods. What's the government gonna to do to fix box? Ban imports? What would that do to our standard of living? Of course, if you're just looking at the money we're sending overseas through box, it looks bad but it actually reflects something that's good for our standard of living. The second point is along the same line. MPY is in deficit because we're borrowing money for investment. Investment is good. Investment increases our productive capacity. What's the government gonna to do to fix MPY? Ban borrowing from overseas? What would that do to the cost of borrowing and investing in Australia? So again, if you're looking at the money we're sending overseas in the form of servicing costs, it looks bad but it actually reflects a source of long-term growth, that is investments. Building off these two points is my third point. The CAD is sustainable by exports. This is because investments increase our productive capacity, which means we will develop more exports, which will fix the deficit in the long-term. Furthermore, current account outflows cause our dollar to depreciate, which boosts our international competitiveness, making our exports even more attractive and incentivizing us from buying imports, and that's how CAD is sustainable by exports in the long term. And going back to Mr. Keating's warning for my fourth point, the balance of payments constraint has not been observed in Australia. We didn't become a third rate economy or banana republic. 
We enjoyed sustained economic growth while having a CAD for 44 years. My final argument in defense for the CAD is called the Pitchford Thesis. A lot of students find this pretty complex. This is an argument that states that as long as the private sector is responsible for the CAD and foreign liabilities instead of the government, it's not a major concern. Why did he argue that it's fine as long as it's not government? Well, the answer is in these two assumptions. First, we assume that the private sector is rational. We assume that they have assessed their own risks and deemed it a good investment to borrow money, like good responsible adults. The government, on the other hand, can often make irrational investments, perhaps due to political pressures. They often misallocate resources because they don't have the profit motive that the private sector does. So they're irrational in comparison. Secondly, we assume that even if the private sector makes a bad investment, they themselves bear the cost, like good responsible adults. On the other hand, if the government's investments fell through, who bears the cost? Whose resources are wasted? It's the taxpayers, us. So those are some of Professor Pitchford's assumptions in defense of the CAD. You could argue against these assumptions too. For example, the US housing crisis that caused the GFC in the late 2000s was arguably caused by irrational or misinformed private sector investments. And governments did have to use taxpayer funds to bail out large financial institutions to keep the whole financial system from collapsing. So that debunks both of the assumptions. I know this is a lot to digest. We have indeed covered a lot of layers of arguments going back and forth. Truth is, you may not even have that much time in your exam to cover all of these points anyway. I mean, the script for this video is 1300 words. So part of your exam skills is to plan ahead, decide what's worth covering, how much depth to include, and what details to omit. But at the very least, I hope my explanations have made it easy for you to understand these economic concepts. If this video has helped you, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave a comment below as well. I'll see you next time.